Please be seated. Good evening. My name is uh, Colonel Art Athens. I have the honor of serving as the director of the Vice Admiral Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership here at the Naval Academy. And I'd like to welcome you to the uh, William C. Stutt Ethics Speaker Series. Uh, Mr. Stutt is a 1949 graduate of the Academy, served five years in the Navy and joined the investment firm Goldman Sachs and eventually rose to the position of limited partner. He and his wife uh, donated money to allow this series to occur and it began in 2005. Their intent was to establish a series that allowed third class midshipmen to think deeply about ethics, character, and leadership. And tonight we have an opportunity to fulfill Mr. Stutt's vision as we listen, reflect, and take action. Our guest speaker tonight is Dr. Peter Singer, a senior fellow and director of the 21st Century Defense Initiative at the Brookings Institute. He's the youngest scholar named as a senior fellow in Brookings' 90-year history. Dr. Singer received his BA from Princeton and a PhD in government from Harvard. He's considered to be one of the world's leading experts on changes in 21st century warfare. He's written for the nation's most prestigious newspapers and journals to include the Boston Globe, the LA Times, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Foreign Affairs, Current History, and Parameters, and provided commentary for ABC Nightline, BBC, CBS 60 Minutes, CNN, Fox, NPR, Al Jazeera, and the NBC Today Show. Perhaps he's most famous, though, because he showed up on the John Stewart Daily Show and was interviewed by John Stewart, and John Stewart was thrilled with, uh, with the work that he's done. Dr. Singer has written three thought-provoking and influential books, Corporate Warriors, The Rise of the Privatized Military Industry, Children at War, which is a book that explores child soldier groups, and his most recent, which came out this year, is called Wired for War, a look at the implications of robotics and other new technologies for war politics, ethics, and law. Wired for War made the New York Times nonfiction bestseller list in its first week of release. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Singer with us tonight. Please give him a warm welcome. introduction and it's a real honor for me to be here at this session uh, that's an honor of a great American. It's a double honor for me in that another great American, my grandfather, was on the faculty here actually right after World War II. My mother was actually born on the grounds here so in many ways it, um, it's been it's very special to get the invitation here. What I'd like to do is uh, open with a scene of war from the book and you have to imagine yourself in Iraq and hidden along the road in front of you is what looks like a piece of trash, but it's actually an IED, an improvised explosive device that the added surgeon has hidden with great care. Now by 2006, there were more than 2,500 of these IED attacks in Iraq every single month, and they were the leading cause of casualties among both American troops as well as Iraqi civilians. Now the team that's hunting for this IED is an EOD team, Explosive Ordnance Disposal. And they're the pointy end of the spear in the effort to stop these roadside bombings. In a typical tour in Iraq, an EOD team will go out on more than 600 bomb calls. That is, they'll defuse about two bombs every single day. But the number that's probably the better indicator of their value to the war effort is the fact that the insurgents put a $50,000 bounty on the head of an EOD soldier. Unfortunately, this particular bomb call would not end well. And by the time that soldier got close enough to see the telltale wires coming out from that IED, it exploded. Now, depending on how much explosive is packed into one of these roadside bombs, you have to be as far away as 50 yards to escape death or injury from the fragments coming at you with bullet speed. In fact, even if you're not hit, just the sheer force of the blast can break your limbs. That soldier, though, had been right on top of that IED. And so when the dust cleared and the rest of their team advanced, they found little left. That night, the unit's commander sat down to do their duty, and they wrote a letter back to the U.S. And they talked about how hard the loss had been on that unit, how they felt they'd lost their greatest soldier, 
how they felt they had lost a soldier that had saved the other's lives time and again. And they apologized for not being able to bring that soldier home back to the U.S. But then they tried to talk up the silver lining that they took from the loss. And this is what that officer wrote. Quote, at least when a robot dies, you don't have to write a letter to its mother. Now that scene may have sounded like science fiction, but was actual battlefield reality. That soldier that was killed was a 42-pound robot called a Packbot. That letter didn't go back to some farmhouse in Iowa like is what happens in all the old war movies, but actually went to a factory right outside Boston that on the side of it says, I, Robot. That is, it is named after the fictional Isaac Asimov novel and the not-so-great Will Smith movie <laughs> in which robots start out by carrying mundane chores and then move on to making decisions of life or death consequences. Now, I know this is heresy to say at a military site, but I am not one for power plug. And, um, <laughs> oh, no, don't worry, this is not gonna be a click through. These are just simply images to give you a sense of the reality of these technologies. Every picture that you see here, every video that you see here, is of a system that is already operating in Afghanistan and Iraq right now, or already at the prototype stage. Nothing that you see is science fiction. Nothing is powered by Vulcan technology. Nothing comes from the world of fantasy. Nothing is powered by teenage wizard hormones. This is the real deal. <laughs> now, to pull back from this, something big is going on in the history of war, and maybe even the history of humanity itself. The US military went into Iraq with over, with, I'm sorry, went into Iraq with just a handful of drones, UAVs, pilotless planes. We now have over 7,000 of these in the US military inventory. We went into Iraq with zero unmanned ground vehicles, ground robotics. We now have over 12,000 in the US military inventory. And these are just the first generation. They are the Wright Brothers flyers. They are the Model T Fords. <laughs> They are the Model T Fords compared to what's coming. And the term killer app, or killer application, doesn't just describe what iPods have done to the music industry. They take on an entirely new meaning when you're talking about arming these systems with everything from machine guns to Hellfire missiles. Now, that's where we're at right now in terms of numbers. Peering forward, one Air Force three-star general that I spoke with talked about how we'll soon be talking about, quote, future conflicts involving tens of thousands of robots. But these numbers matter in another way, because we aren't gonna be talking about tens of thousands of these kind of robots. We're gonna be talking about tens of thousands of the prototypes robots, of tomorrow's robots. Because one of the things you have when you're talking about technology is Moore's Law. The idea that you can pack more and more computing power into our microchips such that their power basically doubles every two years. Moore's Law is the reason, for example, if you gave your mom a Valentine's Day card that opened up and played a little song, that card had more computing power than the entire U.S. Navy did back in 1960, that one card. Peering forward, that means that our systems, these systems that you see here, will be a billion times more powerful than today within 25 years. I need to be clear here, I'm not saying a billion, sort of amorphous, meaningless, you know, Austin Powers, one billion. I mean, literally, take the power of those systems and multiply them times a one with nine zeros behind it. What that means is the kind of things that we only used to talk about at science fiction conventions like Comic-Con need to be talked about by people like us, need to be talked about by people in the halls of power, need to be talked about in the Pentagon. We are experiencing a robots revolution. Now, I need to be clear here. When I say robots revolution, I don't mean that you need to watch out for the governor of California showing up at your door, all of the Terminator, or something like that. We're talking about a revolution in war and technology. That is, every so often, a new technology comes along that rewrites the rules of the game, forces us to ask new questions about not only what's possible, but what's proper. In war, these are things like the atomic bomb. Now, there is a difference, though, with robotics, because every previous revolutionary technology changed the how of war. 
It was a system that had a dramatically bigger boom, like the atomic bomb. A system that shot dramatically faster, like the machine gun. A system that allowed you to shoot further, like the longbow or the gunpowder revolution. That's definitely happening with robotics, but they are also the first to affect not just the how, but the who. That is, they reshape warriors' experience and the very identity of warriors themselves. Another way of putting it is, humankind is starting to lose its 5,000-year-old monopoly on the fighting of wars. Now, I thought that was a kind of big deal, so I set out a few years ago to write a book about it. And the way I went around is basically interviewing anyone and everyone that connected to both war and robotics today. So interviews with scientists working on these systems, everywhere from DARPA to Office of Naval Research. Interviews with the science fiction authors who inspired them, but many of whom are actually quietly consulting for the Pentagon. Interviews with those in service. Everything from what it's like to be a 19-year-old drone pilot to basically what almost every four-star general, every combatant commander thinks about these systems, what it's like to lead them. Interviews on the civilian politician side, for example, with every single service secretary, such as SecNav, SecArmy, etc. Interviews with the opposite side. What do Iraqi insurgents think about our systems? What do they think about us using these systems? What do newspaper editors in places like Pakistan or Lebanon think about this? Also wanted to get a sense of the ethics and the laws of war questions. So interviews at places like the International Red Cross or Human Rights Watch. Now, the stories that come out of this I think are fascinating, they're scary, they're interesting. But they also shine a light on some of the dilemmas and questions that we are soon going to face in our politics, in our law, in our ethics, you name it. So what I'd like to do is basically flesh a few of these out for you. And the first of which is that, as you see here, the future of war is not just going to be an American one with these technologies. There is a rule in both technology and war. There is no such thing as a permanent first mover advantage. So quick show of hands. How many of you use Commodore 64 computers right now? How many of you played Atari video games? Atari video games on your Atari machine. Those were dominant players. They're not dominant anymore. The same thing in terms of war. The British invented the tank. The Germans figured out how to use the tank better. So the US is definitely head of military robotics right now, but there are 43 other countries working on military robotics. They range from countries like Russia, China, Pakistan, Iran. We actually just shot down an Iranian drone over Iraq last week. And so what we have to ask ourselves is, where does the state of the American manufacturing economy and the state of science and mathematics in our schools take us in this revolution? Or another way of phrasing it is, what does it mean to be deploying more and more soldiers whose hardware is made in China and whose software is written in India? But just as software has gone open source, the same thing is happening in warfare. That is, these technologies are not like something like the aircraft carrier or the atomic bomb, where you need a massive industrial structure to put them together. A lot of them is commercial, off-the-shelf technology. Some of it can even be do-it-yourself. For about $1,000, you can build your own version of the Raven drone. If you remember that video of the guy who tossed the handheld system, the Raven drone, it's one of the most widely used systems for in Iraq and Afghanistan. About $1,000, you can build your own equivalent. What that means is that we have a flattening effect when it comes to war.